and um, just say a few things about Karen. Karen Tilburg is the president and CEO of the Forest Society of Maine, which is a statewide land trust that focuses on Maine's North Woods. They're based in Bangor. Karen has a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Biology from the University of Vermont and a law degree from the University of Maine um, Law School. Before joining the, Fair, the Forest Society, Karen worked for many decades in both the public and private sectors, focusing on conservation law and policy. And in her free time, she enjoys fly fishing, hiking, canoeing, Nordic skiing, and artistic pursuits, clearly taking advantage of all there is to offer up in the Bangor area. And um, as I learned when I was looking at the Forest Society's uh, website earlier today, they are one of the top five land trusts in the country based on the number of acres that they preserve. So I think Karen is um, <laughs> well qualified to talk about this topic of the role that Maine, uh, Maine forests play in climate as a climate solution. So without further ado, I'm going to mute myself and take it away, Karen. And thank you so much, Karen, for doing this. Well, thank you for inviting me. And um, I am Karen Tilburg, and it's it's just um, kind of coming home in a way for me to be invited um, to speak to CREA, and now CREA merged with Brunswick Toxin Land Trust. I, I used to live in Bodenham for almost 30 years and was uh, played a minor role, but um, a proud role of, with many others in, in um, the Cat Hands uh, Preserve um, being created and, and a strong supporter of CREA and um, was involved in that for a number of years. So I'm pleased to see it continue. And um, I should say my daughter, I think, was one of the first high school members. <laughs> so um, I'm very proud of all of that, that CREA and the Brunswick Topson Land Trust have done. Um, so um, I was asked to speak about Maine's forests um, and their role as a natural climate solution. Um, I want you to ask questions. So please um, ask questions and, and maybe um, Caroline, you could help me if you see someone's hand or, cause I can't see everyone's little boxes here. So um, what I, I'm gonna try to do is, is just give it sort of a quick, um, reminder of how big um, and important our forests are in Maine and talk a little bit about the role they play as a natural climate solution and then what's happening um, through uh, state public policy and um, goal setting to um, hold on to our forests and talk briefly about um, carbon uh, sales. <laughs> And um, we'll, you know, just sort of see how how this all flows, um, where your interest is, and where your questions are. And if I can't answer something, which is very likely, um, I'll certainly do my best to to get you information. So let's see, how do I advance here? Hopefully, I should have practiced this part with you. How do I advance? I wonder. Okay. Um, I think. Oh, there you right go. Now. Yeah. Um, so the Forest Society of Maine is um, a land trust, a statewide land trust. We um, were basically formed in 1984 um, on paper, but we began to be staffed in 1997. And our mission is very clear. It's um, simple. Um, and that is to conserve Maine's forest lands to sustain the economic, ecological, cultural, and recreational values of the Maine woods. Um, we will be celebrating our 40th anniversary next year. And um, as Caroline mentioned, we have grown to be one of the larger um, land trusts in the nation in terms of acres of easements um, held. We hold now over a million acres of easements in Maine and mostly um, in the, the big North Woods. Um, <clears throat> we really were created by a, um, a consortium of, of forest um, landowners and conservation leaders um, to really fill a niche that was identified that there, there wasn't a major uh, uh, organization focused on, on the, the big forest landscapes 
that provides so many values. And it's out of that determination that the Forest Society was created. Um, I think, you know, I, I think about this a lot. I'm sure most of you do as well. You know, how important globally forests are. Um, I like to just remind myself of the fact that we have forests around the globe, but um, they're, they're not everywhere. And so when we find intact forest landscapes, we should be mindful of them and um, bring stewardship to them. Um, this is a nice slide that um, reminds us of how, how uh, forested um, the, the Northeast is and certainly how forested Maine is. And Maine is one of the most forested states um, in, the, in the country. I really want to emphasize how unique Maine's North Woods are um, as an, an intact forested landscape. Um, the, it is probably the, the, the most intact forested landscape east of the Mississippi River. Um, it's the darkest sky east of the Mississippi, and this is a, a depiction of, of a night sky with lights. Um, it's deemed globally significant for um, migratory songbird habitat. Um, it is unusual in, in its um, lack of fragmentation, and um, it's, it's relatively uh, undeveloped qualities. Um, much of the North Woods, which is around 10 to 12 million acres, depending on one's view, much of it is unorganized territory where there are no organized towns and few public roads. Um, we use easements as our basic tool. Um, many, it sounds, I looked at some of the names as they were coming in here, and you probably are familiar with easements, but I'll just um, tick through what they are. They are legally binding deed restrictions. Um, uh, they, they define limits and provide guidelines um, or actually terminate certain property rights. Um, we do only permanent easements and they're created according to state law. Um, there's essentially um, a, there's an agreement that is reached um, by a landowner and the holder of the easement, or in this case, Forest Society of Maine, on what those um, permitted and per prohibited uses um, should be. And those are written in the easement. Um, and recorded in the Registry of Deed and um, are intended to continue in perpetuity. Um, and underneath um, them really is the important um, goal of identifying the conservation values that the easement is designed to um, protect and that the prohibited and permitted uses um, support that those conservation values and goals. And um, in terms of Maine's North Woods and the very large intact forested lands that we have, um, easements have, have are a particularly powerful tool to bring conservation, um, to prohibit development and division of large areas of forest land. Um, this is a, a map that shows um, the Forest Society of Maine's um, project lands, um, you can see the green and the red are the areas either that we hold easements um, or that we um, monitor easements. If we do monitor um, some easements on state land. Um, we've also started putting on our maps, in addition to other conserved lands, which are in gray, um, the Labanaki tribal ownership lands. And here you can see a relatively recent tally, although we just took another easement last week of um, our, our easement um, obligations. Um, so um, why are we talking about trees? <laughs> um, I just wanna make sure I have one thing here. Um, I wanted to um, just remind us why trees are so important and why forests are so important. Um, 
Trees can help mitigate climate change by sequestering carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then storing the carbon in the wood and soil. And this slide and the next couple slides um, are material from Dr. Ali Kosaba um, with the Vermont Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation. And I, I found um, these slides to be particularly helpful um, just in reminding us that um, when uh, carbon dioxide, water and sunlight um, are uh, drawn up into a tree, <laughs> it creates sugar and water and oxygen. And the sugar essentially is, is the food for the tree and um, it becomes essentially um, carbon that's stored in the tree and also in the soils. And that's the basic premise here that, that trees take up carbon dioxide and they sequester it and then store it. Um, I always find it helpful to kind of talk, remind ourselves of the definitions um, of, of some of these terms. Um, climate resilient forests are the best path to ensure a long-term climate mitigation effect. Um, so the idea here is that you're, as we move into stewardship of our forest resources and our forests, that we, we do that in uh, mindful of, of their climate resiliency. Um, and the resiliency means the capacity of forests to withstand and recover from climatic events, trends, and disruptions. So resilience in the case of forests means a diverse forest, an age and stand structure um, that can bounce back from um, uh, different weathers and, and other um, events and disruptions. Um, Adaptation um, means reducing the vulnerability and advancing resilience through enhancements to or avoiding degradation of forests. Carbon storage is the total um, amount of carbon in a, in a tree or an acre of forest or cord of wood. So storage is, is sort of the carbon that's, that's um, then um, taken up and kept in, uh, if you will, becomes part of the tree. Um, or a stand of trees or a forest of trees. And then again, carbon sequestration is the process of taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then storing it. And that's, um, there are lots of synonyms, um, absorbed, taking it in, storage rate, change in storage, um, but it is essentially taking up the carbon um, dioxide from the atmosphere um, and in the process of photosynthesis and then storing it. Um, just um, again, this is from Dr. Kosoba's work, um, but I think it's helpful to get a sense of this. <laughs> um, on the very bottom axis is a forest sand age in years. So you're going from the left-hand side, zero year, over to the right-hand side of 125 years and then beyond. And then um, the uh, vertical axis is the carbon storage. And um, so um, as a stand of trees or a forest of trees gets older, you're accumulating and storing more carbon in it, in the soil, the litter, the deadwood, and the live trees. And that's what that um, upward line is showing over time. Um, a different uh, way, however, to um, look at, at a forest over time in terms of its relationship with carbon dioxide is, is to look at carbon sequestration and how that might vary over forest um, stand development. And there are periods of time in a forest stand development Again, looking at the horizontal axis, zero to 125 years, and the vertical being the um, CO2 being taken up by that stand of forest, say, that there, there is a period of time when there's a more um, carbon sequestration as the trees are in more in their youth because they are growing very quickly. And so um, one thing that I try to remember when I'm talking to people is 
are we talking about the amount of carbon stored in a forest, or are we talking about its um, age in terms of its um, potential for carbon sequestration? And I'm not an expert in this, but this is a um, the, the general pattern that a, a younger stand will be sequestering at a higher rate of, um, of sequestering the carbon dioxide. Um, now this this um, is is something that I when I first learned this a number of years ago it it kind of knocked me over. Um, but this is, information is from the University of Maine and I was part of a natural and working lands subgroup under the Maine Climate Council a couple of years ago and I I will be serving again as it's just restarting its work. But in that that first um, iteration a couple of years ago. We learned that Maine's forests sequester, remember that's taking in carbon emissions equal to 60% of the state's annual carbon emissions. So our forests are taking in at least 60% of the state's annual carbon emissions and annual carbon emissions are from our cars or from you know, different um, manufacturing facilities or, or heating um, devices. And so they are a really important part of our ability and our desire to reduce uh, over time um, and mitig you know to, to move toward net zero. Um, and, and so we and want to hold on to our forests. Um, and the 60% figure rises to about 75% if durable wood products are included. In other words, if the harvesting um, of the trees are, are then put to wood products um, that are durable as opposed to more ephemeral, like you know, um, burning wood or, or um, products that don't have much of a long life. Um, so th this is quite something. <laughs> and, and it became a really important part of the Natural and Working Lands um, Group's uh, re recommendations that were included in, in the state report. Um, it's also, you know, obvious, I think, to many of us that our, our forests uh, maintain and enhance water quality and, and bring so many other benefits, um, but, but really in terms of um, how they play a role with climate solution, um, it's, it's their carbon sequestration. They also provide shade. They, by maintaining and enhancing water quality, they're um, helping um, with uh, buffer storm events and, and runoff and, and other um, events that with stronger weather patterns can and make more um, challenging. Um, so keeping Maine's forests as forests are, became key to the state achieving its carbon neutrality commitment by 2045. And the, the research that this Natural and Working Lands Group did um, identified that at that time, and this was probably three or four years ago now, Maine was losing about 10,000 acres of natural lands annually, and that it was predict is predicted to increase. Um, I just included one slide here just to kind of make the point that we are seeing development pressure in the edges um, of, of the um, bigger forested landscapes. Um, and this is just one example um, of the development pressure that we saw um, in Oxford County, the, the increase in real estate transactions. Um, the fact that people are moving into Maine um, and they're moving for very many reasons. Um, and, and there is an increase in development um, to provide housing, which is important, of course. Um, and, and some of that is, is having an effect on our, our uh, natural lands. I just, I'm on the Moosehead Economic Development Corporation and learned that um, Greenville now is, 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 has the highest valuation of, of any town in Piscataquis County more so than even Dover Foxcroft because there's a, a huge second home um, boom going on there. And um, many other gateway communities to, to the big woods are experiencing uh, development pressure. 
So one of the con the conclusions that came out of the Natural and Working Lands Group um, was that conserving forests is critical to maximizing carbon storage, um, support working forests, ensure valuable ecosystems remain in place for future generations, and contribute to Maine's fight against the negative effects of climate change. It was identified that conserving forests through conservation easements is one of the more, more cost-effective strategies to help reach carbon neutrality and that easements maintain forest cover and help maintain and enhance wildlife habitat, provide clean water and support outdoor recreation jobs. Um, so this was um, all included in the uh, final Maine Won't Wait report um, and that came out in December of 2022. And um, it, again, it basically said as a goal, protect natural and working lands. Increase by 2030 the total acreage of conserved lands in the state to 30% through voluntary focused purchases of land and working forest and farm conservation easements. Focus conservation on high biodiversity areas to support land and water connectivity and ecosystem health. So, um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the, the cons um, Maine um, Climate Council has restarted um, a, a renewal process of, of looking at the progress that's been made since that report came out and what more do we need to do or, or should we refine or, or strengthen um, the recommendations. So the 20, 2020 was the baseline for the report. And at that time, 21.5% of Maine's lands were conserved. In 2022, the number was estimated to be 22%. And just in case you're curious, that's about 4,336,762 acres. And then um, the progress that report that was just recently um, updated indicated that more than 50,000 acres of new lands were conserved um, both in 2021 and another 50,000 in 2022. And um, the Maine Climate Council has restarted this working group to focus on how to accelerate conservation action. And we'll be having our first meeting in the next month, I believe. So um, it's a little hard to see, and I apologize, but perhaps you, you can get a sense that conservation lands in 2002 is on the left. And um, these were easements and fee um, lands by state and NGO. And then <clears throat> conservation lands in 2022 are on the right. And that is about the 21, 22% that we um, are around now. Um, and just so in case you can't read everything, <laughs> Easements are in yellow. Green is is fee ownership by by state or or federal or NGO ownership, and red indicates a double layer of of um, conservation, if you will, where an NGO owns the land, and then there's an easement um, layer of protection over that. Um, um, so in addition to the um, Maine Won't Wade and the Natural and Working Lands subgroup, um, the governor also created a forest carbon task force. And I also served on that. Um, and it was formed to develop a voluntary incentive-based forest carbon program for woodland owners of up to 10,000 acres. So this was really focused on the fact that we have a lot of smaller woodlot owners in Maine and that many of them are, are getting older and perhaps facing a time of transition where they may either want to sell their woodlot or, or transfer it to the next generation. And might there be a way to have incentives or other programs that are more available for this group of landowners, which own quite a bit of land, um, that, that might encourage um, managing more for carbon sequestration and storage. Um, so this group um, met, we met for a while <laughs> and um, ultimately we recommended timber management practices that increase carbon storage for smaller acreage landowners, 
and also supporting the use of lower impact harvesting equipment and um, identified that it would an area that, that that where we might be able to make some changes would be to the open space current use taxation program that could integrate another option for carbon management into that program to have uh, that result in um, some benefits from lower property taxes. That didn't have enough time to really get developed, so that has not taken place yet. Um, so um, tell me if I'm going too quickly. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot here. So there, um, as that group met, we heard from lots of people and lots of um, experts in, you know, what what could landowners do to manage for forest carbon and increase forest carbon in their woodlots and woodlands. We heard from university um, specialists and experts and um, other practitioners. So the starting point was recognized, and this I think is in the very beginning is it also, the group said, prevent forest loss. <laughs> um, you know, try not to have it converted to development or, or out of forest uh, characteristics. I don't have it be, you know, conversion. Try, try to hold on to the forest because it's, it's sequestering and storing carbon as it is, we're already at 60% of our annual emissions are being sequestered and stored by these forests. Um, it was recognized that there could be passive management where the landowner just lets the woodlot be the woodlot and it doesn't do anything, just lets it be the forest that it is. And that's called passive. Um, active would be to, to take some kind of forest management that might um, accelerate the carbon sequestration. And remember that graph I showed you that there's certain um, periods of time in a forest stands um, evolution where there's more active sequestration. Um, there are a couple key terms here um, that I'll mention. One is a term additive and the other is the term leakage. So as our group talked about various forest carbon management strategies, um, one of, of the, the, the sort of an underpinning goal would be in any program to not have a program that resulted in everyone being passive, say, <laughs> And then all the, the forest harvesting goes somewhere else to another state or to another part of the world to supply forest products. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's important to be thinking about, is there a way to manage for forest, manage a forest that is beneficial for carbon um, and, and that, that isn't just pushing over on a large scale, the the use of wood products elsewhere, um, and that that's kind of a leakage or additive component. Um, that's leakage. Excuse me. An additive would be that there's actually the management is is enabling the forest to stand to to sequester more or store more carbon. Um, and the, the second bullet here is, is mentioning again, this idea of resilient carbon, managing for resilient carbon. So um, that's really thinking long-term about the resilience of a forest stand and the persistence of a forest carbon benefit. So I'm gonna make an exaggerate, uh, use an example that's an exaggeration. You might not wanna clear cut or heavily cut a forest stand so that you have that initial, um, uptick in sequestration because you you know you're you're putting all the eggs in that sequestering early stage basket basically you're you want to look at the the forest for that longer term storage um, of the carbon and maybe have some parts that are sequestering more um, aggressively so it over time that the entire forest is resilient and has different stages and that um, is storing carbon long term, and maybe there's some areas where there's more um, active sequestration. 
then in every case, you must consider the specific conditions, the potential vulnerabilities of the forest, say to um, wind throw or insects or other, um, other kinds of events. And the goals of the landowners, some landowners are more interested in maybe wildlife benefits or other certain kinds of wood products. So all of those go into thinking about how would you want to manage for forest carbon. Um, here are the basic strategies. These were included in the report and, and um, they're fairly common sense, but um, I'll, I'll mention them. Um, increasing species diversity um, is, is seen as, as good because you're, you're getting different rates of carbon sequestration and storage in a more diverse forest. Increasing structural complexity so you don't have all young or all middle-aged or all old, but, but some different ages. And also structural means dead and downed trees on the ground that are have carbon in them. So there's structure there. Um, extending rotations of trees um, in terms of between harvests, having longer periods of time between harvests um, and, and letting trees store uh, the carbon uh, for longer periods of time. Thinning to improve growth of remaining trees is seen as a very important strategy because when you thinned, um, the remaining trees are in that more um, youthful period of time of sequestering more aggressively because they're growing faster. As I mentioned, increasing deadwood um, pools, leaving those branches um, uh, on the ground. Retaining big trees, we don't have a lot of them, and retaining them is there is a lot of carbon in those big trees. Establishing reserves where it's the passive approach, where you're just letting nature take its course and um, having having maybe a component of the forest that's a reserve. And then, you know, it's easy to forget, but minimizing harm to to the soils and residuals because the soils have a lot of carbon in them. These are the basic ways to manage for carbon on your woodlot. And um, again, how you how you uh, prioritize them depends on on your goals as a, a landowner and um, your specific uh, features of your, your area. Um, these slides I, I got from, there are a few of them here from Charlie Levesque of the Northeast Foresters, who has some very um, helpful slides, which I um, um, he's offered us to use them, which I thank him for. Um, and basically this is a bit of reiteration of what I just said, um, but, um, you know, being thinking, being aware that the timing of the benefits and costs can vary depending on how you apply your management. Um, you you want to be thinking about whether you're you're increasing or or decreasing the carbon pool of your forest stand. Um, you they can alter that rate of change or that uptick of the, of, of carbon sequestration. Um, and um, he also mentions that nothing is guaranteed because there can be storm events and there can be other events that um, might take down a forest. So these are all things to be keeping in mind when you're thinking about forest carbon management. So I'm going to transition now to forest carbon offsets. <laughs> so are you with me there, everyone? Um, this is a, a lot about um, all things forests and carbon. Um, so let's say you you have your woodlot, you you understand how important it, a role it plays um, and means um, getting to net zero. You're proud of it. You you are managing it. However you choose, some, you know some of you might manage it passively. Some of you might do some thinning. Some of you might plan very a mix. Um, but then you, you're aware that you still have costs um, associated with managing a woodlot and property taxes perhaps, and, and you know maybe some other costs. So you hear about forest carbon offsets and um, you're intrigued, you know, what are these things and should I consider them? Um, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to say one thing back to what I was talking about. The strategies that I listed would apply to any size forest landowner. So they would also apply to larger forest landowners and very large forest landowners. So um, I just uh, wanted to mention that um, even though it was the, the task force was focused on on how the state and, and colleagues um, might work with smaller woodlot owners, many of the strategies would apply to any size landowner. So back to forest carbon offsets. Um, so basically the purpose of them would be to allow entities who are emitting carbon dioxide um, to um, indicate that they are offsetting those emissions um, because they have paid for a landowner essentially to um, take actions to sequester and store more carbon. Um, for the landowner, um, a selling uh, a forest carbon offset would might help finance forest management, restoration, conservation, or other activities. So if if you stick with me here, pretend you have 500 acre woodlot and you are interested in um, managing to to actually try to increase the carbon storage on your lot, you can find a carbon broker and the broker will work with you to um, come up with an agreement for how you plan to manage your woodlot to store more carbon or sequester and store more carbon. And then the broker brings it to those entities who want to offset their emissions and the, those entities buy the carbon offsets. So, um, I'll try to walk through that again with this slide. Again, this is um, from Charlie Levesque. Um, so the little tiny circle that says carbon project, that, that's you with your, your 500 acres of woodlot. Um, and you, you come up with a project. You, you feel like you know how you want to manage your forest in a way that will actually sequester and store more carbon. And you're excited about it. So you go to a carbon developer, which is, I use the word broker, but it's um, an, a company that helps a landowner develop a project and monetize the offsets and enroll projects in registries. So the next circle is the carbon registries. And these um, are, are essentially registries where um, carbon offsets are, are um, transferred um, and um, and it sets methodology for estimating carbon offsets and they, you register the, the carbon broker developer would, would register the project. And then the carbon market is where um, the buyer, um, the entity that wishes to offset or, claim that they're making the world a better place would buy the offset. Um, and carbon markets can be either regulatory or voluntary compliance markets. Um, California has a regulatory market um, and a voluntary um, market is one where um, it's not required by regulation but a, 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 an entity can might might want to show that they are trying to offset their emissions like an airplane company or some other emitter. And so they might go to a voluntary market and buy carbon offsets there. So this is a very simplistic view of a very complicated world. Um, I worked on a carbon project uh, with my current job with Forest Society of Maine, and this was a number of years ago, but um, we were trying to conserve about almost a 5,000 acre parcel, and we were able to work to have, a, it's an ecological reserve, which means it's passive. Um, there is no harvesting permitted in, in a, on it forever. 
and we're able to sell that on the California regulatory market. Um, and that helped pay for the conservation. Um, no longer can we in Maine um, have projects uh, sold on the California market, um, but it was very helpful at that time for us to help bring this permanent conservation to a very special place that will always be a, a reserve. <clears throat> so um, this again is pretty deep, you know, I, I <laughs> don't hesitate if I'm not clear or if you'd like me to explain, try to explain um, again or differently. Um, again, these slides, this slide is from Charlie. Um, so key requirements for carbon offsets. Um, so when, when you're selling a carbon offset, you want to show that it's real, that, that the, the action that the landowner is taking is, is measurable um, and it, it's um, additional so that it's actually gonna do more storage and sequestration, that it can be verified by an outside, um, in an outside way, that it's permanent and that it's enforceable. Um, and these are, are pretty tough criteria. Um, and um, I'm only gonna say that the whole carbon market world is, is in deep flux right now. And um, because there's a struggle underway to try to come up with consensus around how to verify um, carbon offsets and agreements and sales. And to do so in a way that the buyers are getting really something that's additional, that it can be verified, that it's real. It's not just, you know, someone saying, oh, I'm gonna, you know, take better care of my woods. And that um, it can be enforced if the landowner breaks the contract. Um, Karen? I, yes. I have a question um, from Pat. She's asking, is the carbon market another type of forest management or is it basically something that incentivizes a different type of, for or a particular type of forest management? It's um, incentivizes it. So it's a, a marketplace, if you will, where um, commitments from landowners to manage their forests differently that commitment is usually in a 40-year contract or sometimes a 100-year contract. And that commitment is put essentially sold on a marketplace and someone buys that commitment. But it originates with the decision of a landowner to manage differently. And is the are, are the payments, are they annual or is it a one-time thing or how, how, does, how does that work? They differ, um, so I'm I'm hesitant to to say that I know even the latest arrangements. Um, the the um, agreement that we worked with was an upfront one um, that was very sizable, um, but then at at a certain point um, it could be renewed. Um, but I think it's fair to say that there's some proposals for annual payments. There's some for one time upfront and some that might be every 12 or 15 years. Um, but it's something that the broker, the developer would be working with the landowner to figure out what are you gonna do that's different to manage your forest? How can we verify it? Um, you have to put it in writing and, we, and um, it needs to be able to be um, demonstrated that it, it's happening. Um, so, and then they talk, they discuss a period of time. The agreement can be, as I said, 40 years, 100 years. There's some that are shorter, I think. There may be some for five, but it's it's a very, you know, if you're ever thinking of doing this, you should talk to a few different carbon brokers um, and um, hear how they're approaching it. Um, and I think even some NGOs, um, TNC, and, and I think it's American Forests that um, are, are exploring um, an incentive program that would be slightly similar, but if you engage in it, then that 
would be sold on on the mark on the carbon market. So the idea is that the landowner is making a commitment that could it's and and it's it's something that is um, recorded um, so that if the land sale sells, um, there's there's an obligation to finish off the agreement. Um, I have a couple more questions. Uh, is it possible for an individual to purchase an offset that will apply to Maine forests? And if so, how would how would someone go about that? I don't know. Um, and maybe that's something I could get back to you, Caroline, um, to see if, if that's possible. Um, there are the registries where carbon brokers register the agreements. Um, so that it might be possible to then go to the market and buy buy something. I, I just don't know for sure. That's a very good question. So I'll make a note of that. Um, and I wonder if that is something that will be coming so that people who want to buy, mm -hmm. like individuals who mm -hmm. want to buy, I mean, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you yeah. can buy carbon offsets for you if you're flying somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's it would be similar to that just through, it's just involving something that a very different type of offset, which is some portion of a main forest somewhere. Yeah, no, I, um, I'll um i bring that as well to this group that we're having, our, the forest carbon group that's been re-initiated um, to explore that. Because I think it would be attractive if someone wants to, you know, buy one and know you're making a difference here in Maine. That's, that's wonderful. Um, I have another question. Can you give another, can you give an example of some of the forest management practices that owners of smaller woodlots have used to qualify for carbon credits? I assume it's some of the things that were on the list that you yeah. gave. Before. I think any of any of those things on the list could be done by a smaller woodlot owner. Um, I I should say that one of the goals of that group was to make more available carbon programs for smaller woodlot owners. <laughs> And um, I, I would say I was an advocate that that Maine Forest Service work perhaps with one or two carbon brokers to develop a program that Maine woodlot owners could enroll in if they wished, because many of the brokers won't spend any time with smaller woodlot owners. They want the big guys and gals. They want the 5,000 acres or more um, projects because they make more money as a broker on the bigger projects. So. Um, we we made some headway when we met, you know, a year and a half ago as a group, but we we didn't finish our business. Um, but one of the things that was successful was there's a, a I think just hired forest carbon specialist at Maine Forest Service, and I think the idea is in part to be able to be a resource for smaller woodlot owners who are interested in trying to um, maybe do a forest carbon offset sale themselves or have an agreement and get some kind of monetary reward for their efforts. Oftentimes there's more cost involved in managing for more carbon and make it that in many cases may enable the landowner to, to continue to own their land and, the, and because it's, it's costly. So that is a continued goal, I think, of, of this group that's been re- Reinitiated is how how can we make these programs more available to smaller woodlot owners? Is it is it possible to give? I I'm sure there's a a wide range, but um, to give us a sense of like how much money uh, a landowner you know obviously it would depend on what's on the ground and um, you know how they propose to manage it, but you know. We know that there's a ton of land, you know, forest land in southern Maine that has small <laughs> pole-sized trees, many pole-sized trees in them, um, growing on them. You know, and if if there were someone who owned 50 acres who wanted to manage that, what they could expect to get, um, you know, for for implementing 
management practices that would increase the carbon carbon sequestration potential of the of their fifty acre woodlot? Um, it again, I I feel that I'm I I don't because there's so few programs right now available for small woodlot owners. I I I'm hesitant to to even provide a number, but um, you know, I I'm that's thinking, fine. I I was yeah. just. You I'm, know, I'm thinking curious. that it's in the if if folks want to Google the Maine Forest Carbon Task Force report, I think we may have some figures in that from two years ago that might be helpful to get a sense of it. Um, I mean, I I can vaguely remember how much we received with our carbon offset for this one parcel, which was about four thousand three hundred acres, and and it was about $1.5 million, um, but that was some time ago now. And um, again, the California regulatory market, um, but it, innate, it made a big difference in helping us conserve that land. So, um, but I, I don't think you can necessarily scale that to a smaller woodlot. So I would encourage folks to take a look at the Maine Forest Carbon Task Force report, and you can Google it. Um, and I think there may be some, there's quite a few appendices and there may be some reference to what a, a going rate at that time was for um, some of these programs. Um, I have another question. And I, I should add that it is a market. And so I, I um, because of the issue of verifying any size carbon sale, um, I think that the market right now is 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 pretty um, in flux. I think I used that word before, and and so my I think most people feel that it's going to solidify and stabilize in the next few years, and it'll be much more predictable what you would get if you brought a good <coughs> project forward. Um, and and um, so you know I would say that it's it's worth learning as much as you can right now. Um, now that there is, I believe, a new forest carbon staff person at Maine Forest Service, um, I'll be finding out more about that. And, um, you know, I, I think the whole goal is that they would be um, available to talk to, to smaller woodlot owners about what they might do. And so I think it's going to get better and easier to learn more in the next year or so. Um, I have one more question and then we'll let you finish your <laughs> presentation. But um... This question is, your earlier slide implies that optimal st carbon storage happens if a stand is harvested every 40 to 50 years. That's a rough guess. And the harvest is turned into durable wood products. Obviously, this has a particular set of ecosystem, ecosystem impacts. Is this the kind of management that the state government is hoping to incentivize? Well, I, I don't know what slide that person is referring to, but the one that I remember talking a bit about was the one that went to 125 years. And that one showed the greatest carbon storage. Um, and, and again, another strategy um, that was mentioned a couple of times was longer rotation. So um, the, the Forest Carbon Task Force basically listed strategies it didn't I, they, the only one it prioritized was to keep the forest as forest and in the strategies which are not prioritized are more active management which might include if you already are let's say you're harvesting on a 20-year rotation you might want to consider lengthening that to 40 or 50 years um if you have a forest stand that that is very um dense, you might consider thinning and then letting those trees grow for 40 or 50 years. So I, I think the question really didn't capture what I was trying to convey. I think there's just a variety of strategies depending on the goals. But I, I think the fact that that the, the Carbon Task Force identified a range is important. And I think 
the storage is greater the longer the stand is and um, the older the stand. Um, and so that slide went out to about 125 years. Great. So um, that's it for the questions for now. So why don't you? <laughs> I, I think I'm nearing the end and I, I realize, oh my gosh, time has flown. These are very good questions. Um, oh, I did want to say something um, generally about conservation easements and forest carbon storage. So as I mentioned earlier, we do easements and the um, many landowners we talk to, many family ones especially, ask, can we do an easement and sell a carbon offset down the road? Um, and the answer is yes, you can. Um, first of all, um, you can sell an easement that is is where, where you're giving up your development rights, um, you're, you're agreeing um, to manage sustainably, um, you're agreeing to prohibit you know, commercial um, activities, um, roads, utilities, um, et cetera. But you can still sell a carbon offset um, if you then go beyond the terms of the easement and um, then um, say move into more passive um, management or very long rotations, which the easement wouldn't require necessarily. So. You can you can do both easements, which are permanent, and forest carbon um, agreements, which are temporary but have ma many of them long lives. Um, and the combination together would you know could be very powerful in terms of c keeping the forest intact and undeveloped and unfragmented, and and ensuring a basic level of sustainability. But then with forest carbon agreements, you might be managing in a much in a way that would bring more diversity and longer rotations and and um, older trees to our forests, which are are the kinds of steps that are often included in forest carbon agreements. Um, and again, you know, they both can be tailored to the the landowner's goals. Um, So they can go hand in hand, um, depends on the terms of the easement. And um, if the easement terms permit forest management with fewer restrictions, then landowner keeps open the option to sell carbon offsets on their timberland. Um, I don't know if these are readable on your end, <laughs> but there are a lot of resources out there. And um, I think, again, looking at the um, Forest Carbon Task Forces guide would be useful, or the report. Um, so I, I know it, it looks like we're already past eight, but that's my email. And Caroline, I will um, follow up with you at least to uh, answer that question about can a person um, buy a main, a main produced forest carbon offset? <laughs> And I, I hope this has given you a, a sense of, of how important our forests are to sequestering and storing carbon, that steps can be taken to sequester and store carbon on a greater degree than we do now. Um, and um, that carbon agreements might help landowners manage in a, in a way that brings greater diversity, older trees, um, and longer rotations, which um, benefits both carbon storage and also other ecological benefits. Um, uh, that last question, Mark says, uh, thank you for taking the question. He says, yes, the storage in the forest continues to increase with age, but the flux diminishes. I'm not sure what the what that refers oh, to. Yeah, that, so the rate of sequestration, sequestration goes down. Oh, I see. Fine. Yeah. Okay. So the rate of that. And so it, it's when when talking about that, you you have to look both at the individual trees and the whole stand and and how um, a, a whole stand is is where that stand is. Um, and 
you know, I, I think the idea of the carbon resilience is that if possible <laughs> on a larger scale, having different ages and different um, rates of sequestration and storage is, is gonna probably ideally be the best for, for carbon resilience. One of the things, one of the tools that um, helped me <laughs> just get um, some context for carbon was there's a tool, I think it was called iTree, and um, you can go out and measure, I think that you can estimate the height of a tree somewhere that you're familiar with and measure its um, diameter and enter that in and it'll tell you how much carbon it sequesters annually and how much is stored in it. And it's really interesting to do that with two different size trees um, because it shows you, I mean, it's obviously an estimate, but it shows you um, both how much the, the rate increases as it gets older um, and what the total is that's stored. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a neat tool for getting some context for um, the carbon cycle in trees. Um, I think, um, again, back to the question that is very thoughtful. N Maine's northern Northwoods has overall a pretty young age class. Um, southern Maine has an older age class. Um, and rotations are now getting closer to 20 years. Um, so moving to longer rotations is seen as a desirable goal. Mm -hmm. especially the northern part of the state, maybe thinning in some of the southern areas to allow for more growth would be desirable, but it really depends on the landowner. But if a program is available that can give incentives, especially to this huge class of smaller landowners who might, you know, you know, this might really engage them in, in their ownership and management of their woodlot in a way that can also continue that it, the land to stay as a forest and, and transfer to a next generation is seen as a real plot plus. Yeah, it'll be neat to see what um, what tools are developed for the smaller woodlot owners, because um, there are a lot of them in Southern Maine. Northern Maine is easier to work with because there's so many, but... Um, but anyway, I'm not seeing any more questions and I want to let everybody get back to their evenings. So thank you so much, Karen. This was really wonderful. Um, and hopefully everybody has a has a better understanding of- I hope so. And it's, it's a fast moving and rough and tumble world out there with carbon offsets and, and all the data and all the, the modeling, but um, stick with it because I think in, in the next couple of years, we're, we're, things should settle out and- and um, there'll be more clear available options for any size landowner in Maine, and that I hope will bring health and, and sustainability to our forests over time. Yeah, and I'll, um, there's some nice thank yous in the chat, but I will try to um, look up some of those resources you mentioned and email them to folks who, who were on, on the call, so. Thank you so much. And remember, the first and most important thing is to keep it as a forest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Showing up tonight. Take care. Take care.